Welcome. Uh, for those who may not know me, my name's uh, Phil Green, one of the elders here. We're in Luke chapter 20 this morning. I was just mentioning that I appreciate Bob switching with me from last week because we were out of town. But uh, because of the fact that we switched and I uh, kind of moved forward a week, um, I actually have a passage today that talks about taxes. Uh, I like taxes because uh, uh, I work for local government. I get my money from taxes. And so we get to talk about taxes this morning. So anyway, uh, just interesting how that worked out. Um, as has been mentioned by uh, most of the teachers as we've been going through these sections recently, um, it's very, very important for you to remember where we are right now in the life and the ministry of Jesus here in Luke chapter 20. So keep this in mind. The triumphal entry has already occurred. It is now Passion Week, we oftentimes call it. So that time period in between the triumphal entry leading up then to Jesus' arrest, trial, and crucifixion. Jesus, at this point in time, is almost daily coming back into the temple and teaching in the temple. Uh, and the religious leaders are right there. And he comes onto their turf and talks about some significant things. And what we'll see in today's passage, and we've seen recently and we'll continue to see in the next few passages, some of the best-known confrontations with the religious leaders occur at this time. Very key, significant things. They are passionate in their hatred for Jesus at this point. They want to get rid of him. As we'll see today, they're just simply scheming on how they are going to go about doing this. How can they get rid of him and not stir up the crowd at the same time? Two main sections that we're looking at today in Luke chapter 20, verses 19 to 26, I've kind of titled, Whose Likeness and Inscription? And we'll see the significance of that coming up. Whose likeness and inscription? And then verses 27 to 40, errors in thinking regarding the resurrection. Errors in thinking regarding the resurrection. If you're keeping track of parallel passages, uh, we have two parallel passages in the Synoptic Gospels for this particular section, and that would be Matthew chapter 22, verses 15 to 34. Matthew 22, 15 to 34. And then in Luke chapter 12, Verses 13 to 27. Luke 12, 13 to 27. Pray with me and we'll get started. Father God, we do come before you this morning and again. We're here to worship you and to learn from you. Holy Spirit, we're now asking that you open our hearts and open our minds to see the truth that is revealed here. Uh, Lord Jesus, help us to understand you better. Help us to understand the challenge and the struggle that you were receiving from the religious leaders at this time and then teach us the reality of this truth and help us to burn it into our hearts and our souls so that we can function in a way that is uh, honoring and exalting to you and so that we can talk to other people about the great things that you have accomplished and that they might come to put their hope and their trust in you as well. It's in your great name we pray. Amen. All right, Luke chapter 20. Again, the first passage, verses 19 to 26. Whose likeness and inscription? So follow along with me. Luke 20, 19 to 26. The scribes and the chief priests sought to lay hands on him at that very hour, for they perceived that he had told this parable against them, but they feared the people. So they watched him and sent spies who pretended to be sincere, that they might catch him in something that he said, so as to deliver him up to the authority and jurisdiction of the governor. And so they asked him, Teacher, we know that you speak and teach rightly, and that you show no partiality, but truly teach the way of God. Is it lawful for us to give tribute to Caesar or not? But he perceived their craftiness and said to them, Show me a denarius. Whose likeness and inscription does it have? And they said, Well, Caesar's. Then he said to them, then render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they were not able in the presence of the people to catch him in what he said, but marveling at his answer, they became silent. So verse 19 obviously is a transition from what Bob had covered for us last week in that previous section, specifically with the parable of the vine growers. And he specifically was calling them out. And they acknowledge at this point that he, he's talking about us. 
when he's talking about you know, this, this vine that had been entrusted to these individuals and now they were supposed to take care of it and then ultimately offer it back to the rightful owner. But they wanted to keep it for themselves and use it all for themselves. And they realized that Jesus had been speaking about them. They hated him for it. They wanted to get rid of him. Yeah. Well, again, it's partly because it's what it says here, the, the people. I mean, there, there, was, there was such appreciation for him from the crowd that they realized that if we turn against him, at least publicly, we're going to have those people turn against us, and that's not what we want. So somehow we've got to get him to say something, do something, that enough of the crowd is going to be willing to turn against him. Uh, ultimately, what we see them do is they probably ended up bribing a lot of the people that initially were in the crowd and offering for that crucifixion. And then, ultimately, people just kind of go along with the, the party, if you will, you know, and, uh, and we see that happen later on. But at this stage, at least, they're very, very concerned publicly about how they're going to try to do this. But they definitely want to get rid of him. They've wanted to be getting rid of him for a while. What goes on? Uh, because the religious leaders, again, feared the people's judgment, they then sent spies. Now, Mark, in that parallel passage, specifically identifies them as Pharisees and Herodians who came now to try to trick Jesus into saying something that would get him in trouble. Uh, and this oftentimes happens. And those of us who happen to peep, uh, you know, have opportunities at times to speak publicly uh, you always understand the, the, the kind of precarious situation because if you play a little too much to the crowd, and especially here, these spies were trying to trick him. It even said there in verse 20 that they pretended to be sincere. So they're kind of luring him on and trying to egg him on and say things that are nice about him, hoping that he might go too far. Keep in mind, he might say something that would offend the Jews and that might go clearly against their teaching. And sometimes he would do that, especially when he was focusing on himself and trying to talk about who he really truly was and that he deserved worship. And they would then accuse him of being, um, you know, speaking against God or blasphemy because he claimed to be God. Well, if you are God, it's not a false claim. So he would acknowledge that at times to people. So they're hoping here that he might say something against him. In fact, we'll see later on in the trial that they accuse him of saying things like, ooh, tear down the temple and I'll rebuild it in three days. Uh, obviously, that would have been a, a violation against the Jews, something that they were concerned with. And those Jews, even at that time in the trial, were willing to take those Jewish accusations to the religious leaders and the governmental leaders of the day, hoping that the government would do something about it. So he's, on the one hand, worried about offending the Jews, or they're trying to get him to say something that might offend the Jews. On the other hand, and specifically with this question, he's now trying to get them to say something that would offend the Romans. And if you say something against the Roman power, oh, they, they might crack down on you, and they'll just take care of you for us. And so that's the specific intent, I think, of their question that we're going to see in this particular passage, speaking especially against Caesar and money and taxes. So verse 21, we see them being insincere here, where they simply ask him with these glowing terms, Teacher, we know that you speak and teach rightly. <laughs> Yeah, right. Uh, and that you show no partiality, but truly teach the way of God. Oh, we, we can believe everything that you say. I think, again, trying to get him to the point where, hey, this is a friendly crowd. I can, I can push the limits a little bit. I can say something that you're going to agree with, but maybe the Romans are going to take it the wrong way. And that's ultimately, again, I think what, he's, what they're trying to get him to do. And then here comes the big gotcha question. Is it lawful for us to give tribute to Caesar or not? I talked earlier about the fact that this is about taxes, and ultimately that is what it is. But they use this term here that kind of pushes the edge a little bit. Now, it is true that you would pay your taxes as tribute to Caesar, but just as, uh, you know, in English, we have a variety of different words that we can sometimes use for different things, so it was true here. They didn't use a more kind of just generic term for having to pay your taxes. No, this is not just a tax. This is a tribute. It's showing honor now to Caesar and giving him respect. Are we Jews who are being occupied supposed to give tribute now to Caesar? 
Well, it says in verse 23 that obviously he perceived their craftiness, their scheming. He fully understands and understood the heart of men and what it is that they were trying to do. This, this word craftiness is a good one. New Testament uses it in various places as well. Clearly says that as Christians, we are not to be crafty people, especially when it comes to the scheming uh, aspect of it, because craftiness is the idea of manipulation. I, I can do something or say something to try to get ultimately something that I want from someone else. That's being a crafty person. Not talking crafty like doing crafts. You know? <laughs> uh, th- this is a scheming kind of a person. And that's not something that we're supposed to do with other people. But these individuals being crafty, they were trying to trick him and get him to say something that would be inappropriate. So again, Jesus, now, how are you going to answer this? Are we supposed to pay tribute to Caesar, the occupier? I thought you were all about Israel and, and uh, restoring Israel and this kingdom that you've been talking about. Jesus' answer here is brilliant. He uses great biblical logic to show the proper balance between earthly things and heavenly things. And notice the distinction that he makes here, and it's important, I think, even for us as we deal in this life to treat certain earthly things with just the earthly nature that they are and yet highlight heavenly things at the same time and use that to our advantage, this distinction between earthly and heavenly. And he asks the question, Show me a denarius. You know, a, a denarius was a coin that basically represented a day's wage. So think about how much money you would make in a full day, an eight-hour day. It's a pretty hefty amount here that he's asking to see. Show me this denarius now. And whose likeness, whose inscription is upon it? Look at it. And ultimately, the question is, where does that come from? What realm does it belong in? Whose inscription and likeness is on it. And they properly answered, Caesar's. Uh, that's true always. Uh, I, I don't know if you uh, enjoy collecting money or not, or looking at different kinds of money or not, uh, but it's always fascinating uh, to look not only just in the modern age with printed bills and different coins from around the world, but historically, all the way back to the beginning of mankind. Uh, they haven't just put, you know, common Jane uh, on a coin. It it's always represents power in authority, or someone politically significant to that particular country. That's who gets their face on a coin. So it is here that uh, we have this image now of Caesar on these coins. And Jesus, rightfully so, says, give your obligation, or give that thing, if you will, to the one in whose realm it belongs. He says in verse 25, then render to Caesar, give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. He could have stopped right there, but he didn't, because this is the brilliance of the logic. He could have just simply said, hey, it's got Caesar's picture on it. Give it back to Caesar. Belongs into him, his realm. But he goes on to say, and to God, the things that are God's. And he draws this important contrast now between, again, earthly things and heavenly things. We should rightfully use earthly things for earthly purposes. And you shouldn't be surprised about those. And they're very natural kinds of things that need to be done. And this is where the taxes piece comes in. And again, the New Testament picks it up. And Paul talks a lot uh, in uh, Romans 13 about the importance of government. And government has a role to play. Whether we like it or not, it always has. God has ordained government to help kind of control society and do certain things. And along with that always comes taxes because that's, you know, the money's got to come from someplace. Uh, and governments then extract that money from their citizens. That's all in the earthly realm. And that's okay. And we can have great discussions and debates, and you know, societies constantly do over the levels of tax- taxation, the kinds of services that are provided. But those are all on the earthly human realm. Jesus says, give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. Whatever Caesar demands, it's got his picture on it. Not a big deal. It's in his realm. But again, he goes on in a brilliant way to say, but give to God the things that are God's. 
And I think he's right back to the question that they asked. Whose likeness and inscription? Whose likeness and image, if you will? That coin had the image of the emperor. The people. The people have the image of God. And they should give to God and deal with God in his realm. And I think this is a brilliant opportunity for us as we continue to function with people today. If you're looking for opportunities in today, modern day America, to talk to your friends and neighbors about the gospel, maybe an interesting way to bring it up is to say, hey, whose image do you bear? Whose image do you bear? Because the Bible tells me that all of us bear the image of God. Even in our fallenness, even in our sin, there's still that image there. And just as that coin then, with the image of Caesar on it, represented that it lived in the realm of the earthly and could be dealt with in the earthly, you've got a heavenly stamp on you. There's a divine stamp there that you need to learn to deal with. How are you going to deal with it? Well, the Scripture has a certain approach to that. Let's, let, let me share with you what the, what the Scripture says about God and His creation and what He's trying to accomplish in the world through His Son who you know, came and lived a perfect life and died upon the cross. It's a great opportunity for you to kind of use this illustration and open up a conversation to the gospel because it really is true that the things that are God's belong to God. It, there's a stamp on you. And it's the image of God. Not, not, a, not a righteous image anymore, obviously, but, but one that is designed to have a relationship with Him, the Creator. So I think a unique opportunity for us to be able to talk to our friends and our neighbors, again, using even this illustration. Tell them you learned it in Sunday school. You know, we've been studying it recently and wanted to talk to them about that. Well, it says in verse 26 here that the, the crowd and the people who came here to kind of question him were not able to say anything more about this. He basically just shut them up. It was, a, again, a great logical answer that they marveled at, and therefore they became quiet. Well, some of them became quiet. Some of them still had another question, and so we're going to see that going on in the second section this morning, which is verses 27 through 40, dealing now with errors in thinking regarding the resurrection. So it goes on, verse 27. And there came to him some Sadducees, those who deny that there is a resurrection. And they asked him a question, saying, Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies, having a wife but no children, that the man must take the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. And they go on to tell this story. Now there were seven brothers. The first took a wife and died without children. And the second... And the third took her, and likewise, all seven left no children and died. Afterward, the woman also died. So in the resurrection, here's the question, in the resurrection, therefore, whose wife will the woman be? For the seven had her as wife. And Jesus said to them, The sons of this age marry and are given in marriage, but those who are considered worthy to attain that age and to the resurrection from the dead, neither marry nor are given in marriage. For they cannot die anymore, because they are equal to angels and are sons of God, being sons of the resurrection. But that the dead are raised, even Moses showed in the passage about the bush, where he calls the Lord the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Now he is not God of the dead, but of the living, for all live to him. Then some of the scribes answered, Teacher, you have spoken well, for they no longer dared to ask him any question. Again, another opportunity that these religious leaders have to try to trick Jesus into saying something that's wrong. And specifically here, we have the Sadducees talking to him. Now, in this particular passage, what we're going to see is two significant truths that are kind of presented to us. Uh, the first one 
is some biblical teaching regarding a physical resurrection from the dead. So there's some really good content here uh, where Jesus talks about uh, what we get to look forward to. Physical resurrection from the dead. I've got to stop, though, and say that, uh, you know, uh, hopefully you noted verse 27. Because uh, from a teacher's perspective, uh, this is one of those classic passages where we get, you know, the classic statement that we like to talk about when it came about the Sadducees. Uh, you know, who are the Sadducees? When you want to teach your kids what were the Sadducees all about, it says it right here. The Sadducees are those who deny that there is a resurrection. They say there is no resurrection. That's why they were sad, you see. <laughs> okay, come on, laugh with me. You know, it's okay, it's in church, I know. Uh, this is that place right here where you get it, and it's laid out for you right there perfectly in this particular verse. Who are the Sadducees? They were more the, the liberal wing of the religious leaders of the day. In fact, Acts chapter 23, verse 8, describes them this way. It says, uh, For the Sadducees believed that there was no resurrection, nor angels. They didn't believe in spirits, but the Pharisees acknowledged them all. In fact, Paul was astute enough and smart enough when he was dealing... Falling apart there. He was smart enough when dealing with these religious leaders that he liked to play off the distinctions between the two groups of them. And, and it served Paul's purposes at this stage in Acts chapter 23 to being a Pharisee himself and believing more conservative and therefore believing in supernatural things and miraculous things to basically say, hey, the whole reason I'm on trial right now is because I believe in the resurrection of the dead which, of course, all of his fellow Pharisees would have, and the Sadducees that would have been part of that ruling cohort at the time would not. And so he uses that as a distinction between them. So the Sadducees were sad because they did not believe in the resurrection. They had no hope from that standpoint to look forward to. So we're going to see in this passage some good biblical teaching about a physical resurrection. And this is still an issue that we face today. Uh, I remember as a young boy growing up in a mainline denomination literally having debates with pastors over the physical resurrection from the dead. And they denied it, didn't believe that it was important, didn't believe that it was essential. Have you read your Bibles? You know, it, it's critical uh, for all the things that we hold to and all the things that we believe in. So we'll talk a little bit more about this <laughs> sorry, uh, physical resurrection from the dead. The second point, then, that we'll look at is uh, what God's Word, that God's Word is precise in what it says, even to the point of the verb tenses. And that's ultimately what he's going to get at at the very end of this section, that you can trust in God's Word to such degree... <laughs> All right. Testing, testing. We're okay. We're going to go on. We'll get through this, folks. All right. Um, so, again, the second thing that we'll look at this morning uh, is just the reality, again, that God's Word is so trustworthy and so precise that even the verb tenses have meaning to them. And Jesus clues in on that when he's talking, again, about uh, this great resurrection that we have to look forward to. So some important principles that we have there. Uh, a little bit of trivia, and of course, uh, everybody loves a little bit of trivia. Uh, this particular passage also has, in many ways, what is the second shortest verse in the whole ESV translation. The second shortest verse. I don't know if you picked up on it. No, most people know the shortest verse in the New Testament, which is? 
Jesus wept. Okay, that's very good. That's from John chapter 11. Uh, the reason I mention this is these are fun little things just to know. They're not just trivia, but sometimes they're helpful. In, in John chapter 11, Jesus is talking about Nicodemus. Uh, not Nicodemus, uh, <laughs> Lazarus, in the resurrection of Lazarus. It's Lazarus' tomb that he's standing at when he weeps. So if you remember that, that Jesus wept, it's John 11, that's where Lazarus' uh, death and resurrection is recorded for us. So John 11, verse 35. And what is the second? And the second is what? And the second, very good. <laughs> so if you notice in verse 30, chapter 20, verse 30. Uh, at least here in the ESV, it just simply says, and the second. And the second is, and the second. Yes, very good. Now, it's not always known that way because in the King James Version, the King James actually has, and the second took her to wife, and he died childless. But it's partly because the, the King James Version comes from a slightly different manuscript family. It's a little bit longer in that particular section. But yeah, I thought it was interesting when I was working through this, and it's like, that's a short one. And it says, and the second, and it's probably the second shortest. Uh, now, actually, it's probably not really the second shortest if you count, or it's tied at least, if you count. Another great short one, if you want to have this down too sometimes, is 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16, which is very, very appropriate for all of us. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 16, Paul reminds us, rejoice always. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing, he says. In everything, give thanks. Uh, for God. Uh, so rejoice always. So anyway, back to the main point, biblical teaching regarding the physical resurrection. Some religious arguments sound good or may seem logical from a human perspective, but ultimately they are biblically foolish because they willingly either ignore or reject the clear teaching of Scripture. And that's what Jesus is faced with here. They paint this scenario, these Sadducees, thinking they can trick him into acknowledging, oh yeah, that makes no sense, and this you know, poor woman's going to have seven different husbands, and who's really going to be the one husband that she gets to spend eternity with? Jesus is like, you don't fully understand what's going on here. Yes, this woman was married to multiple men, and again, they argue that if being raised from the dead means that you continue then to be married to the people that you were married to, what's this poor woman supposed to do? But again, they don't fully understand the reality or the truth that is being talked about. Jesus reveals the real truth, that marriage exists in this earthly life only. In Matthew chapter 22 and in Mark 12, the two parallel passages, they also record a comment that Jesus makes. This one's specifically from Mark 12, verse 24, where Jesus says to them, when they, they pose this question to him about, okay, whose wife is she going to be? He says to them, is this not the reason that you are wrong? Because you neither know the scripture nor the power of God. He basically says, Two things wrong with you right now. Number one, you don't really understand the scripture, and I'm going to teach you that here in a second. And number two, you don't understand the power of God and how God can literally raise people from the dead. Because you don't know the scripture, Jesus says. And the Old Testament clearly teaches about the resurrection. Daniel chapter 2 in verse 2 says the following. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to eternal life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Daniel talked about the fact that there was a resurrection to come, and not just a resurrection of the righteous, but also a resurrection of the damned. And that all humanity will spend ultimately eternity in an eternal body either in the, the glory and the amazing presence of the Lord or under punishment because of their sin and their rejection of Christ. So he says, you don't know this, you don't believe in the resurrection because you don't know the scripture. And he says, you don't know the power of God. The resurrection is an amazing, glorious thing for us to look forward to. I wanted to take just a moment to turn in your uh, Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 
Let's just read this a little bit this morning and see the amazing reality that we have to look forward to. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. First Corinthians 15, and notice this long section that Paul talks about here, starting in verse 35, and we're going to read all the way down through the end of the chapter. First Corinthians 15, starting in verse 35, and notice the glory that we get to look forward to. He says here, but some will say, well, how are the dead raised, and with what kind of body do they come? You fool. That which you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And that which you sow, you do not sow the body that is to be, but a bare grain, perhaps of wheat or of something else. Use the imagery of a seed, he's going to say here, that that seed looks nothing like the plant itself that's going to come. It's simply a seed. So it is with this earthly body. This is simply a seed compared to what we have to look forward to. Verse 38, but God gives it a body just as he wishes, and to each of the seeds a body of its own. All flesh is not the same flesh. There's one flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another flesh of birds, another of fish. There are also heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is one. The glory of the earthly is another. There was one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars. Stars differ from stars in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown a perishable body, these these current earthly bodies, but it is raised an imperishable body. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there's also a spiritual body. So also it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul And the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, then the spiritual. The first man is from the earth, and earthy, the second is from heaven. As is the earthy, so also are those who are earthy. And as is the heavenly, so also are those who are heavenly. Just as we have borne the image of the earthy, we will also bear the image of the heavenly. Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we who happen to be alive, we will be changed." For this, imper- for this perishable must put on the imperishable. This mortal must put on immortality. But when this perishable will have put on the imperishable and this mortal will have put on immortality, then, at that time, then will come about the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And that victory is the resurrection ultimately from the dead. But notice how he ends the chapter in verse 58, my favorite verse. Because of this reality, because of this truth about the resurrection, he says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast and immovable, always abounding, in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil, your labor is not in vain. It's not worthless or pointless in the Lord. That's what we have to look forward to. And Jesus is reminding the people of his day that even though these Sadducees are mocking the resurrection, it's a great truth for us to look forward to, that God will, in fact, someday raise people from the dead. There's also, though, the reality that he will raise those who reject him from the dead to ultimately meet that judgment that is deserved because of sin. And again, it's our obligation to be warning our neighbors and warning our co-workers that their house is on fire. Disaster looms, and they need to do something about it. 
All right. The last thing I wanted to point out here, again, is that we can trust God's Word in the precision of God's Word. Again, Jesus in this particular section then refers them back to Exodus chapter 3 and verse 6 when God spoke to Moses through the burning bush. Exodus 3, 6 says, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. But in that Exodus passage, when he's trying to find out who this is that's speaking through the bush, I am the God of your fathers. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The verb tense, I am, is significant, Jesus says. It was not by chance that it was written this way. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He does not say, I was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. If you and I were talking, that's normally the way we would describe something like that. Um, my father died back in December of 2017. My father was an attorney. My father was a salesman later in life. My father is a follower of Jesus Christ. My father is right now enjoying his presence. That verb tense is critical to what we believe. And Jesus picks it up here and reminds them, yes, marriage is only in this life, but it was not that way as Moses describes. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He is their God, still is their God. And as he ends there, he talks about the fact that God is not the God of the dead. He's the God of the living. And they still live. And one day, they'll be back in a physical body again and get to worship him in the physical realm. But now they are with him and loving him and worshiping him in the spiritual realm. And again, even some of the scribes at that time, my guess is it was probably those who were maybe more from the Pharisaic side uh, than the Sadducees side. Some of them spoke up and said, Teacher, you've spoken well. We agree. We believe, with, we believe that. Uh, and so it is for us to look forward to the resurrection to come. Well, we're going to be done a few minutes early this morning unless you've got some questions. Any questions or comments about what we saw here? Otherwise, we're going to continue on as we move forward with this section of Luke. Again, this is Passion Week. Uh, this is between the triumphal entry and looking forward. It's just a couple more chapters, and we're going to get into the arrest and the trial of Jesus, and then ultimately his crucifixion, but great resurrection. So, any questions? Yeah. Um, I guess I'm just looking at this, Bill, and outside of Jesus saying that we're not given a marriage in heaven, is there anywhere that the Pharisees should have known that they wouldn't be? <clears throat> I don't know of any other specific passages yeah, that would refer to that. Um, and again, I don't, <clears throat> you know, obviously the Old Testament, we, we believe in progressive revelation. Obviously there's a lot more information that we have now about the heavenly kingdom than maybe what, what the Jews would have had. Um, but they clearly should have known about resurrection itself. Now whether they should have known, and again Jesus brings up the point that they're like angels in the sense that they never die. That, that seems to be somewhat significant. <clears throat> Obviously, procreation plays a role in this. I didn't really mention it earlier. Uh, is that you know a key part of marriage today? Obviously, it is procreation. When you get into the new kingdom, uh, and you know people are in a resurrected bodies, and that's a fun little theological issue to have some discussion on. Exactly how end times events might work out. Uh, is there any possibility that there might be people in a physical earthly body uh, that? Uh, are transformed and sins removed, but go on forever. Some would believe that, some don't. Again, not, not the point of today's discussion. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, I don't, I don't know of any other particular passage. Maybe others do. Aaron? Yeah, I think the, I think the ties back to what you were saying at the beginning with respect to Brenda and her seniors, um, what they should have known to answer, the way, I, the way I see the answer to that question is what they should have known is that there is this spiritual realm and that there's this physical realm and what Jesus is drawing there is that marriage is a thing of this physical realm, but that is not a thing of this 
spiritual realm. And that really ties into that. I thought it was a really beautiful illustration that you used there at the end. And that is your father. He was, you know, an attorney, but he is the follower of Christ. And that really separates that identity component. Um, because so often, And it's, you know, if you've not had close family members who've passed away, um, you, you, you begin to eventually look at death a little bit differently, and especially if, by God's grace, they're believers, you know. Uh, it just gives you a different perspective on life and things to look forward to. And, uh, and I've wondered oftentimes just the joy my father is having. You know, I miss him, humanly speaking, but his joy is indescribable, you know, as he enjoys the presence of the Lord right now. I look forward to that, to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. Uh, and then we have great things to look forward to someday. And, and again, we can't even begin to imagine what that is like. That's what Paul is trying to emphasize later on. You can't begin to imagine the glory that awaits us. You know? uh, so, appreciate that. All right, let me pray. Father God, we just uh, thank you again for your goodness and grace. Thank you for the truth of your word here. And we rejoice that even as the religious leaders here are trying to trick Jesus into saying something that they think would be uh, something that they could accuse him of and hopefully get you know, him in trouble legally, uh, that even here we have great truth that we can learn from and truth that can excite us uh, for the future. And so we rejoice in the fact that we do have the image of God still stamped uh, upon us, and it's upon everyone. And so give us a burden then to talk to people about your son. Um, we rejoice in the fact that there is a resurrection that we can look forward to. Uh, and it's a resurrection that is literally mind-blowing. Well, we can't even imagine uh, how amazing it will be. And so we look forward to that. And we rejoice in the fact that if it's a long way off down the road, uh, and if we walk that path and, that sh and go through that shadow of death, uh, that we have the presence of the Lord to look forward to now, and then this great resurrection to come someday in the future. But until that happens, Lord, help us to be faithful, uh, and we long for that day for your son to return and to, uh, to draw us to himself. It's in his name we pray. Amen.